Okay. Well, um, welcome to the session, the Saturday session after lunch, the matinee, one might say. Um, you will have noticed on your, um, your brochure that it's called, this conference is called Evidence, Accountability and Transparency, which is in fact also um, the title of uh, the panel today. So just to let you know uh, what's going to happen here is that each of the panellists, I'll introduce, let them uh, read a little bit of their bio so you can see the background. Then in the morning sessions, you, some of you filled in questions for the panel today. So I will uh, read those questions and direct them to the panellists. So hopefully we get a nice interactive discussion going. So to start off with, um, from my left we have um, Judith Walters and one needs to put glasses on. <laughs> right. Um, Judith Walters. Judith is an ex-smoker in the 50 plus years category, she said with a background in welfare, diagnosed with COPD years ago and waiting to die until vaping finally allowed her to stop smoking in September 2014. Now a happy, healthy senior citizen with the energy to advocate against unethical laws in Australia, which turn people into criminals for trying to stop smoking the way they wish to. Right. Uh, next, we have Peter Beckett. Peter is a consultant who specialises in the identification, analysis and management of political risk. He spent nearly three years as head of public policy for ECITA, where he was responsible for industry-level political advocacy during the procedure that led to the passage of the EU Tobacco Products Directive. He has also been instrumental in its implementation, is an expert in compliance with its requirements and was at the centre of negotiations that led to the formation of the CENTC 437 on electronic cigarettes and e-liquids standards. Who writes this stuff? Really? <laughs> <laughs> he, was working, he has worked and consulted for a range of leading vapour companies in the EU and the US. <laughs> Next along we have Gillian Eva Golden. Gillian comes from a background in the creative, customer service and retail sector. A former smoker, thanks to discovering vaping in 2012, she now works as administrator for the Irish Vape Vendors Association, Ireland's only trade association for independently owned, specialised retailers of vaping products. She not only advocates for vaping as a means of tobacco harm reduction, but also for industry stewardship and sits on the technical committee of CENTC 437 for e-cigarettes and e-liquids. And at the end of the panel, we have Amy Faith Ho, who is a doctor. Amy is a doctor in the emergency physician area in the, in the United States. She holds multiple national leadership positions in American medical organisations like the American Medical Association, Illinois State Medical Society, American Academy of Emergency Medicine uh, and Illinois College of Emergency Physicians. She is published largely on healthcare in forums like NPR, Forbes, Chicago Tribune, Kevin MD and others, including several pieces focused on mental health. Her interest in addiction stemmed from her time interning at the renowned Betty Ford Centre and again in the emergency room where sub substance and tobacco abuse is commonplace. Dr Ho is also a seasoned speaker with media engagements including presentations with TEDx, National Public Radio and the Discovery Channel. So you can see that we have a very eminent and experienced panel here. So uh, for those that weren't here when I first started, we have questions that you in the audience have uh, earlier submitted and I'm going to uh, go through those and our panel will answer them. So firstly, we have uh, a question from Robert Innes um, in Canada. <coughs> Looking to the future, to what extent do you envisage, if any, a move away from the importance of the individual consumer advocate to organisation-based negotiations and organisation-based interventions in the battle to have harm reduction accepted. So, who would like to start on, on that? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> well, 
Oh, okay, no, no. Peter. <laughs> Peter, you, 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 you could start then, seeing as you have the microphone. I'm not entirely sure whether or not how the advocacy is organised is particularly relevant. So there have been a lot of different consumer advocates and a lot of different industry advocates over the years, um, which have had, had varying degrees of success. But from the perspective of the people that you're, you're trying to communicate to, which is the, excuse me, the, in, in Europe it would be members of parliament, members of the European parliament, in the States as members of Congress, um, they don't really see how it's organized per se, and they don't really care how it's organized per se. What's important is, is that the message is delivered. Um, and how, how one encourages consumers to contact their, their representatives is, is kind of irrelevant, frankly. The important thing is that there is an operational organizational structure there that enables a, a central hub of some kind to pass information through to the people who are affected by decisions that are made and then encourages them to engage with their representatives and in the right way. I mean, it, frankly, the question isn't, isn't almost, almost isn't the right question. The, the, the correct question is how best to engage with the people that you need to talk to, not how to, to organize yourselves. And if you spend too much time worrying about your own internal politics, you spend a whole load less time actually doing the work you need to do, and that's bad. Okay, um, Gillian, would you would you argue the same thing, or would you argue or put that in in being an effective advocacy, uh, it may be sometimes necessary to have structure and an organisation. Uh, I, I would actually really agree with Peter's last point that it the the internal politics of the organisation matters less than the message and that the message is consistent, and that the message comes from, let's say, all levels of interaction, not just consumers, but that you know maybe physicians are, are putting across the same message for their patients, or maybe like ourselves, people like ourselves, like vape shops, we're putting the same message across for our consumers, that if the message is consistent across all levels, and that the message gets through rather than how it's organized. How do you think that the message um, becomes a consistent message? Where is that organised to ensure everyone is using the same message? Talk, talk, talk to each other. Have, the, have these kind of dialogues. Have these dialogues when, when we all go home to our home countries and just keep talking to each other. Amy, do you have a view? Yeah, I don't really think that individual or organized is necessarily mutually exclusive. I think one leads into the other, and I think it actually goes both ways. So I think individuals, like consumers, um, are certainly integral in shaping how the discussion of how you actually use e-cigarettes and doing things like talking to your congressman. But I think that that aggregate voice, I think someone says yesterday that you have a lot of anecdotes, but when you get a lot of anecdotes put together, it's kind of a survey study. Um, but when you get a lot of those individual voices put together, that's when you band into organizations. And usually with some common theme, either you're all you know, consumers, you're all physicians, you're all public health professionals, you're all you know, nicotine uh, you know, advocates. In, in one way or other, they're going to shape each other. So I, don't, I, don't, I kind of agree down the line that doesn't matter. But I think more importantly is that pushing forward with both helps one another, and as a sum, I think they make a greater impact. Okay, and Judith, oh, what? Uh, in Australia, because um, there's so few vapors, and so there's very little, um, very little structure, and there's so much disagreement among vapors about how we need to approach advocacy. We actually do need the NNA in our case, AU, to have a name, the name of an organisation to attempt to talk to people in public health and politicians because they do not want to talk to us. They're just not interested, you know, mostly. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's all important, obviously. But, um, yeah, stru a structure is vital for us. Gillian. 
Ginny, you... Yeah, I just wanted to say, may, maybe that's something else to take into account, is that what, what works as a form of engagement in one country may not work in another culture and country. So that's something also to consider. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm not saying that, that, that structure is irrelevant, because clearly it's not. What I'm <coughs> arguing, I think, is, and some of you in the audience will have experience of this, is that one can become obsessed with one's own internal structure. And that, that really is to be avoided. Um, when there is, a, you know, there is a vehicle that works, it, it should just kind of be leveraged ra rather than continually obsessing about, about how it works. On this, on this topic yesterday in um, the, the third group um, where consumers were, were, were grouped, there was um, a question or a, a proposal put forward um, to have an, an international sort of organisation of, um, of vapours in a way that coordination could um, take place. Um, there was lots of discussion on that, but one, the main sort of outcome that emerged was to, instead of having a uh, an, uh, an international organisation of vapours, as it were, that in fact the communications between all of the vapours in an international way, so a, a, a strong um, email and contact um, network was established. What, what would you, I mean, just stemming on from that question, how do you see those two options, how, which would you say in your experiences as, as advocates, um, be, be most effective for progress from leaving here? I think if I don't, again, we're talking about whether or not we should organize this way or that way, and it really doesn't matter if it works, great. If it doesn't, scrap it and do something else. I mean, you're never going to find out without trying. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I, I think the way you organize actually does matter a lot, and I think as a lobbyist, grassroots <laughs> is probably something that you're like pretty well familiar with. So this international network, I think that's called the internet. And I think in the past five years, not only in nicotine policy, you can see the incredible power of the internet in social revolutions like Libya, like the Middle East, like literally regimes have been overturned because of Twitter. Um, so I think that's also a very important thing to keep note. Like I think this hashtag GFN16 thing is very cute, but also has real impact. Um, so I, I think undermining that is certain, or sorry, ignoring that and saying scrap it because it didn't work once or, you know, scrap it because we'd rather talk to the FDA, whoever, is problematic. <laughs> uh, but again, not mutually exclusive, not to put you in a, you know. <laughs> Although, hold on now, just let me get to the beginning of the middle here. E easy, easy. I think for, th for those of us who have, let's say, been, you know, been advocating for this either this category or this individual type of product for a number of years, at some stage you do have to, you know, close down the laptop and go out into real life and take it off Twitter. And I think I think personally we're past that stage now. Because, you know, Twitter is great for communicating with each other, but we need to sit in front of people, sit across tables from people and talk to them more and get them to talk to us. I think maybe that's my, that's my view. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, should, should we go? We'll go to another question here. Um, this this question comes from Assistant Professor Natasha Sands from Deakin University in Australia. It's a UK-based question. Um, is anyone in the UK working with NICE? That's the National Institute for Health uh, Care Excellence. <laughs> Um, to develop um, evidence-based guidelines for vaping. Now, it is a very specific UK question, which can be answered by the panel. But I think, I think for something like this, we could broaden it to extend to, in a way, you know, what, what, what sorts of things like um, how could consumers contribute to to such knowledge, and what sort of what do physicians need to need to know from from such information? Like, so. Um, it, we can broaden it out so everyone can, can talk about that. Well, now, I am not from the UK, so I'm going to look at some UK colleagues and they can nod if I'm right here. <laughs> but there, there is a NICE guideline for tobacco harm, for, har for harm reduction. 
There is also the uh, National Smoking Cessation Training Centre document on including e-cigarettes in smoking cessation trainers. There's also a document that came out quite recently about smoking in pregnancy and the role that electronic cigarettes can play in. And then, of course, the RCP report. And there's been the British Dental Association had a report on the use of e-cigarettes. So there's, there's a, quite a few documents out there to inform physicians. And that's as much as I know about the UK situation. And you're a doctor, so I'll pass the mic to you. Oh, Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Board is happy to answer, so. Yes. Oh, we can get you a microphone, Lynn. Um, could you please take the microphone to Lynn? Linda was involved in the writing of some of those documents. Ah, so Linda is perfect. So the, the NICE guidance, the group that I chaired, that was released a number of years ago. The process now is they are reviewing the existing NICE guidance, the suite of NICE guidance on smoking cessation. They've reformed the committee and the tobacco harm reduction guidance will be updated in that process. Um, and that takes about 18 months to two years. So the, that will refer to electronic cigarettes and there will be more specific information in there because the existing harm reduction guidance was developed at a time when e-cigarettes were still very new. So we will see that coming out. But in the meantime, as you said, we are actively working uh, through other guideline groups to, to, to keep things up to date. But that's the nice process. Right. Because health professionals is a powerful way of, of moving change. Great. Could I just but say that if you speak, you do can use the mic, otherwise it doesn't get recorded and doesn't get onto the conference oh. archive or yeah. even into the other room. So just grab a mic if you want to. Speak oh, to okay. We'll, we will make sure of that, Jerry. But, but broadening that question, Amy, from a physician's perspective, what sorts of guidelines and things do you find useful or would find useful? So, so in the United States, there are no agreed upon guidelines. Traditionally, as a physician, you look to your specialty society. So like emergency medicine is one of those, cardiology is one of those, the lung association is another one of those. And then beyond that, the kind of bigger body would be the American Medical Association for where you would expect these guidelines to come out, um, none of which have done that. And I, I think e-cigarettes is kind of a complicated situation because it's because uh, we as physicians have kind of segmented into specialties that are based on organs, and tobacco is something that hits a lot of organs. Um, and so no one really knows who to take possession. So even within cardiology, most of those people that are politically active are interventional cardiologists. So they're the ones that take you to the cath lab if you have a massive heart attack, which may or may not be caused by smoking. But they're not the preventative people. The preventative people are like a very, very small microcosm of that group that don't have a very loud voice and certainly not a big enough one to create any you know, overarching policy. So I, I think the problem that physicians run into is that even if, let's say currently, you would like to advise someone on smoking cessation, a lot of us are not vapors and we don't really know about coils and the different liquids. So you're, you're kind of faced with a problem. First is that you're breaking off from common guidelines in just suggesting e-cigarettes because you think it's the right individualized plan for someone, but certainly not something that would be, um, you know, seen as the, the norm. And then two, you can't really help them um, because I think there's a specific dose dependence that is related with nicotine and we can't say two puffs is two milligrams or something like that, um, which is, I think, goes back to the earlier question of individual um, kind of activism and people talking about how they use e-cigarettes uh, e because I think that's really all you can do is say my patients X, Y, and Z um, have used e-cigarettes, would you like to talk to them? And I think smoking cessation is actually very recently reimbursed for American physicians and as that movement takes over a little bit there I think will be more like smoking cessation clinics um, help groups, et cetera, where people can get together and talk about what works for them. Because that, that was ultimately what changed my mind, because you know, e-cigarettes came out however many years ago, and no one knew anything about it until I worked with smokers who told me that they tried everything under the sun, and e-cigarettes was the only thing that worked. Um, if I could just add, add something. If that's something that, is, that you're going to work on, I would involve um, experienced consumers from the very get-go. 
even you know as as you plan to develop those guidelines because I I've seen documents that have in like the NC N, I can't I don't know the acronym NCSCT that that document involved experienced bakers and what was what was fantastic from you know a retailer's point of view if I wanted to give that document you know to somebody it, it, it involved really specific user questions that a smoker would have about a quite a technical product. And involving the experienced users from the very start is very, very important, I would say. Yeah. I was and a quick, uh, Chris Russell, I believe, is in the audience, has a great YouTube channel on this. Yes. Um, smokers helping vapors to Smokers helping vapors to quit? Vapors helping smokers to quit. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was going to say that yeah, it's, it sorry. seems like a very important role to have consumers involved in. And from your experience, Judith, do you, you know, I think as, as uh, from just reading from your bio, from the fact that you were turned around, your, your life-threatening situation was turned around from being, from, from um, going towards using uh, vaping, how do you see your experience as being very useful to what um, Amy has just mentioned and how might, I mean, going back to the last question as well, um, that, that, that information that those voices of consumers be, be harnessed in a, in a way that can be got to people that need to get it. Some is from what we've heard, but it, it could, there could be perhaps more of that in a, but what, what's your view anyway? Well, once again, oh, sorry. Once again, it's <clears throat> the lack of structure. So, I mean, we, we just, like I belong to a forum and there's, and, and there's so much celebration every time we get a smoker to switch. Everybody's so happy and every time there's a new uh, vapor that turns up, everybody's so happy. But um, we, don't, we have very few vape shops in Australia. And one anecdote, I hope this is relevant to this question, one uh, woman I knew who worked in a vape shop in Sydney, she'd have people my age come in and they'd you know, be really keen to try vaping and they never get to the, but you have to import nicotine bit and it was just too much for them, you know, they're not familiar with internet, PayPal and all the rest of it. So they just go, and keep smoking. And, um... Well, actually, that leads in very nicely to this <laughs> next question, which is from Catherine Devlin, I think. It says, what does the panel see as the role of the vape shop? <laughs> and can or should regulators and public health bodies be making better and more use of this resource? So I think what you're saying, can continue, because yeah, it's yeah, very no. relevant. And then the others might have a comment as well. Well, my experience, I didn't know any vapors. I didn't know anything, so I spent... Uh, weeks trying to figure out, like, what, what is an ego? What is a drip tip? <laughs> you know, it was such a battle to try to get information. This was two, over two years ago. And um, so I eventually spotted what was considered to be a um, trusted vendor. So I emailed them and said, oh, I smoke 50 rollies a day. What liquid strength do I need, where do I get it, what sort of device do I need. So he told me to use 24 milligram liquid and sold me a, a reasonable quality uh, ego type Guinness kit and gone back. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you come back when, you're, when you think No, 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 no. <laughs> but I, the, if I'd been able to walk into a vape shop and say, Show me this, show me that, sell me some nicotine and liquid. It wouldn't have take, taken me five months of dual use to be able to quit, basically. So, so here's the fundamental problem with vaping, is that it's overcomplicated at the moment. The thing, they're a hassle to put together, they're a hassle to use. You've got to refill them all the time. Um, there's a, a learning curve that you have to go through and there's a process that you have to go through in order to take yourself from the point where you begin using your device to the point where you're comfortable with it and you know what works for you. Now, the cigarette, you put it in your mouth, you light it, you smoke it, and it just works. And the vast majority of vaping devices on the market don't just work, 
And that, that's the role of the vape store in, in the market today. It's to help bridge that transition. And if you didn't have that kind of specialized advice, you wouldn't see the growth in the market that you currently see. The end game for, for, for innovation has to be to overcome that learning curve and make the product lines such that they are plug and play and they work for smokers who are used to a very, very simple process by which they get their nicotine. <coughs> At the moment, the simple products don't work for people because they're not very good. The, the, the products that work for people are the products that require a learning curve. And over the next sort of number of years, innovation needs to take products to a place where they just work. And there are some things on the market at the moment that are taking us there. And I think that as the lines develop, we will see more products that work for the broader market of smokers rather than devices that are targeted at the existing vape market. And that's the thing that will really drive the, the tobacco end game. It, it won't be devices like we see today. So I'm going to talk about something completely different, <laughs> but still related to the question. So the question was, what's the role of the vape shop? Yeah. So because I work with these specialized retailers of vape products, and because they are smoke ex-smokers who have found this product to be successful for them and decided to open a business, in some cases some businesses, they're growing businesses, they're employing people, they're generating money in their local community economy as well as for state economy. And Jerry's just stepped out, but I'm going to kind of co-opt his uh, his public lecture in London a couple of months ago, and that's how that's how my guys see themselves, which is public health outreach workers, in a very kind of convoluted way. But it's a uh, so I'm going to talk, I I'm, I'm, I'm may take a little bit of time, Go but ahead. I'll be as, as succinct as I can. So uh, a smoker walks into a shop and they get the technical advice on how to use the product, which I, I would agree with you, it's still a little bit technical. They get the technical advice, they get shown how to vape, because that's also, that it, you know, you need to learn how to vape. You get the kind of um, yeah, behavioral, technical, but unfortunately, we now live in a, a sort of arena where the vape shop is turning into some, it, it, has, it, it has had to turn into something else. So my guys are also having to decipher scientific studies that smokers and early vapors see headlines in newspapers. So they come in with these headlines going, what does this study mean? Uh, is it going to kill me? Is it going to give me cancer? So my guys have had to kind of go on a really steep learning curve of learning this kind of science. And then also we've had to kind of dash hopes and dreams a little bit because it's very hard to explain to a smoker or an early vapor that maybe their local health body or their, their own GP may not be telling them exactly the truth about the science. So, and, and that's very difficult to do, because the, some Doctors of these... Doctors being so trusted some in of, the community yes. and socially. Very. So, so and, and as well as physicians, not, not just individual physicians, but also trusted health bodies. And that's a very difficult thing to throw on to somebody who really just wants to open their shop in the morning, help people not smoke, and close up their shop in the evening. So that's, that's a new role that's kind of, and I think that's spreading, and I think it's spreading a little bit too much and too quickly, and that needs to stop, because that's not our role. So that's what I want to say. We can come next after Amy into what could happen or what might be a solution for that, but please, Amy. Uh, the, way, the way I see vape shops are a little bit like clinics, which I, which I also agree I think is a little bit inappropriate. Um, because, but I think the reason for that is because there is a void for this kind of service, like someone giving you the intel on how to vape and what some of the studies means, and because, at least in the United States, the health professionals can't really fill that void since our governing bodies are not quite there yet, then someone does have to step in, and maybe the vape shops are the ones that have stepped in. 
Um, that being said, I think it is a very essential role, but maybe one that should move away from the vape shops. If you look at any other sort of addiction, like alcoholics, opioids, they all have some kind of community. Like whether it's AA or Narcotics Anonymous, they have something that vapors do not, but they don't exist within the confines of a store where they're making a profit. It, it seems to be a theme here that, I don't know, corruption kind of follows money. Um, and not to say that that's the case in, in vape shops, but I don't see why we make an exclusion necessarily for vape shops in this situation. Well, again, I, I think in status quo, they fill a great role that someone maybe in the science community or, or medical community should be filling instead. But, you know, until we get to that point, I, you know, something is better than nothing. It's harm reduction. Does anybody else have, does anyone have, uh, uh, I think you've all raised really good aspects to the problem. Does anyone have um, any ideas of what uh, a solution, it may be different in different countries, or would setting standards at least, or, or, or some sort of um, agreed upon uh, information to pass to consumers, I if that came from um, you know, a, a health agency or a, or a body, how, what do you think could be a solution that would work fairly quickly? I mean, long term, lots of things can be put in place, but it seems like something is needed fairly rapidly. Well, let's just say, in the, well, in the UK, when the Public Health England report came out, we, you know, our guys saw a surge of smokers coming in the door because it was, a, it was an official document of consensus about the relative safety and risk of the product. And we saw that again with the Royal College of Physicians report. Smokers coming in the door, going, I've read these headlines, maybe they're not so bad after all, 95%, gee, that's quite good, maybe I'll give it a go. But I think, and, and this is country specific, and maybe, the, maybe some people in the other parallel session earlier can talk to this, but you know, that then you've got, certainly in, in, my, in my country of Ireland, you've got the disparaging of those reports by government bodies or by public health or by people in tobacco control. So then, well, what does the consumer believe then? Do they believe the consensus document that's been based on evidence and science? Or do they believe this kind of fudgy fence sitting that we seem to be doing? And again, I don't think it's the role of somebody that owns a vape shop to, to referee that debate. It's like when, you know, when the WHO came out and said that bacon causes cancer. We, we had a government minister straight on national television trying to, you know, save the Irish pork industry <laughs> and, and, and not scare consumers away from having their bacon in the morning. Yet, we've got all these rubbish headlines about e-cigarettes and just abject silence. And I don't think that's right. Perhaps, perhaps um, on this it might be um, useful if, if somebody in, from the UK in the audience, maybe Linda or Anne or someone might actually have a view on this who comes from um, you know, the, the, the public health area that might have a view on whether uh, vape shops or what information should be given to consumers who face the issues just been raised. Anybody? Uh, I don't, who's that? Could someone that's give that's her the, the microphone, please? Okay, disclosure, I'm not public health. I'm, I'm the one who asked the question, actually. I'm Catherine Devlin from ACETA. I just wanted to, to mention that there are a lot of country-specific issues here, clearly, and it's useful that this panel stretches all over the world, um, because in the UK, I think it's really important to mention the work of Louise Ross and many of her colleagues, and everybody here knows Louise. She's doing tremendous work within the smoking cessation service in the UK Health Service to link Inform good, proper information about vaping for her clients coming through the door to the smoking cessation service. And I'd be really interested to hear from the panel whether anybody thinks that it may be possible to do something like that within their own countries. Hi, sorry, I'm Siren from the Bristol Stop Smoking Service. So with uh, the vaping shops in Bristol, uh, it was before the PHE guidance started, we started on a document that basically was saying the same thing as PHE. They released theirs and we finished ours just after. And we made a consumer document and we made an advisor document. So the advisor document were for the practitioners 
out there, letting them, you know, debusting all the myths about e-cigs and giving them practical advice on what to tell their smokers who wanted to try an e-cig and to encourage their patients to try an e-cig. And it told them that you are not an e-cig specialist. You are a self-smoking specialist, but you have no knowledge of e-cigs, how they work, and what to do with them. The e-cig specialists are in the vape shops. So you look after the behavioral support, and if you want to add anything else on NRT, whatever you can, but you indicate them to go to the vape shop to get their support for puffing technique, for milligram, for device, for everything else from them. So it's like a combination. So in Bristol, what we're doing is that we're trying to marry up our stop smoking services with their local vape shop. So they do a lot more partnership work together. So in the vape shops, there is also the, doc the consumer document that we wrote, and it's just one page of A4, but it debunks as well all the myths on e-cigs and tells them about all the safety standards and all that kind of stuff and just tells them where to go. So, and, and it says it's okay, it's 95% safer and it's sitting in their vape shops with Bristol City Council, Bristol Public Health on it. And, you know, and we had an article back in, uh, when was it? It was in March for No Smoking Day. And my team has gone from a 10-man team down to me and, and another specialist. That is it. And we are having to run the show. So we couldn't be out on the streets campaigning. So what we did, we wrote an article, and the article was entitled, Bristol City Council Encourages Their Smokers to Try Vaping. And that's what every city needs to do, to say, it's okay, have a go, go ahead. Because without that, we're still going to have, well, maybe it's not as safe as maybe it, you know, we have to get rid of that. We have to be able to say, it's okay, we need to work in partnership with the shops together and invite them to your festival. So, you know, we have our vapors, we engage with our vapors. Our vapors help us. My vapors educate me. I wouldn't be here without my vapors. I wouldn't educate my advisors without my vapors. So I don't know, I can't get up there and go, vaping is this, vaping is that, this is how it works. But John Summers helps me, Liam Bryan helps me, Judy helps me, all my vaping, they're like my team, they are my buddies. And we met in, on the internet, on Twitter a year ago, but I am here now because of them. And they they're about to educate 50 of my advisors next week. I think it's very clear. <laughs> very clear that here is a very good solution and I'm actually going to, th those, those uh, documents or um, advice that you, you've prepared in that context that you mentioned, would it be possible for you to give um, that to Jerry and maybe then Jerry could yeah, ensure fine. that the conference can, can have that information if they're not aware of it because it sounded to me like a very good solution, um, at least one that is working well um, and needs needs more um, funding or whatever, but yeah. it, it's certainly working. But shows very clearly that there are two distinct uh, roles uh, for the, the vape shop and the, the consumers who can put that information and from the, from the health side. So shall I go to the next uh, question? The next question comes from India, from um, Amir Khan. Um, where do you, sorry, I need my glasses again. Um, where do you find uh, some hope emerging? Malaysia, China, Germany. What is Malaysia doing that others could replicate? I think, once again, this, um, this is a very specific question that maybe for the purpose of the panel, we could broaden it to say, really, on the issue of hope emerging, where in the world do you see hope emerging from in, in terms of... Uh, and, and where might be the more difficult areas in your experience? Like, you know, the, the question asks, where do we see hope emerging? Um, what, what's your view on that? Who would, who would like to go uh, first? Would you? Well, obviously the UK. The UK is a place where we all look to and go, oh, heavenly. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I think parts of Asia are probably the scariest places for vaping. But, um, bag again, sorry. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I could, it makes me feel like crying, actually, almost. 
to hear all the positive things like stop serving, stop smoking services being so uh, working with neighbours. We'd love to do that. You but, can't do um, without. You, you cannot do the work without them. You can't. Well, they don't want to talk to us. Bottom line, they don't want to talk to us. So yeah, Asia's scarier than Australia. I have to say, the UK is our shining beacon. UK a shining beacon. So, um, Russia is a, a very interesting market. It's still uh, a largely unregulated one. Um, it's growing probably faster than anywhere in the world at the moment. Um, Malaysia is pe people tell me is, is an interesting market. But the last I heard, they were, they were seizing a bunch of products, and, and that that could go south very quickly. Um, and um, I, I hear that Korea is, is growing reasonably quickly as well, but um, you know, a, again, they they went the taxation route in Korea, and I think a 10 mil bottle of juice costs something like 30 US dollars. So um, <laughs> that it, it's uh, it, it seems as as though where you get substantial growth in the market, um, burdensome regulation follows very quickly. Um, the, the, the exception to that being the US, where their system is so slow that very burdensome regulations seem to evolve only a number of years after the market grew very quickly, which was very helpful for those that were able to, to benefit from, from the, you know, the open market in the United States, but will be very unhelpful in three years' time when everything's banned. <laughs> I guess I'm stuck defending the United States on this one. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> um, I, I, oh, yeah. oh um, go ahead. Um, we have Clive in the audience having a comment. Sorry, I didn't see you. I just wanted to put a good word in for France. And, and what's been achieved there. In fact, in the last couple of months, a uh, fantastic consensus statement, uh, and it's br they've brought in the government, the academics, the business, the consumers, all working together under a new banner. And I think that's a real model. You know, and it's, it's, a, it's comparable now, I think, to the UK in terms of the way they're thinking of opportunity rather than threat. And that's the key thing to look for. Is it seen as an opportunity or a threat? And if it's seen as an opportunity, the policymakers can work within the regulation to try and make something sensible happen. Yes, we heard about uh, in the in the consumer panel yesterday um, from the fellow from France who is is here. Uh, if he is in the room, wave his hand so other people can see. Yeah, I think what's happening in France is is excellent, Clive. Thanks for raising that. Does anyone else on the? I could tell about to Germany. Yeah. Germany. Yep. Would you like to quickly? Yeah. That's more quick. <laughs> um, Germany is uh, hopefully and very sad looking to UK, and um, we are a little bit jealous too. Um, more or less nothing works over there. The uh, health in institutions are not talking to us because we are too close to tobacco. Um, the politics is uh, really complicated. We got all, you, you saw it outside, we got the, the trans, uh, transposition of TPD already done, and the next step is to, to sharpen it up, to make it, to make it worse. Uh, that's also running, and um, it's very hard to, to find a way to get into this. We, we, are, we are trying to fight against it, but it's not that easy in, in Germany. And uh, so we are uh, not the best place in, in the world for E6 anymore. Um, Thank you. I just want to very quickly say that I think the country-specific situations do still unfortunately rely on the network, perhaps, maybe I'm wrong, somebody in public health tell me I'm wrong, uh, the, the, the country-specific situations still depend on the networks of the tobacco control and public health people moving. So maybe where there are those little, you know, group thinks amongst certain groups of of those people, maybe they need to widen their circles a bit and learn from from other countries. Yeah, I think, yeah, learning from each other. And in fact, 
once again, to go back to the FCTC, I think it's Article 22 requires international cooperation uh, for scientific and legal mutual assistance in, in terms of um, part of implementing tobacco control strategies, which we know includes harm reduction. So it stands to reason that a lot of sharing should be going on in in these areas. So, in fact, it, it comes to the next question. Uh, we have just a few left. Um, this one is from... Um, his writing is big, so I can read it. Atakan Befritz uh, from Turkey, Sweden. The FCA, uh, Framework Convention Alliance, does a lot of work with regards to COP conferences, etc. FCA is separate from WHO and funded by entities like Tobacco Free Kids and Norwegian Cancer Institute. Is this not a huge problem concern? Who would like to, would you like to address that, Peter? As the microphone was just <laughs> thrust your direction. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, the biggest threat to the whole concept and movement behind tobacco harm reduction, using vapor products and using SNUS and using other products, the biggest threat to that is the World Health Organization setting guidelines <laughs> to guide everybody else to do really, really, really dumb things. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about the, the Framework Convention Alliance specifically. There are some very good organizations that are involved with that, specifically ASH in the United Kingdom, um, and I don't, I don't want, to, want to disparage them. But what we've seen of the World Health Organization so far is that it's, it, it, in the end, what, what they're doing is, and, and the best contrast is in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, what we're, we're doing is looking at the evidence and trying to shape our policy around it as best we can, notwithstanding rubbish European directives that I may or may not have had a hand in. Um, <laughs> but what, um, uh, so it, it's policy based, so it's evidence based policy. What we're seeing with the, the World Health Organization is, is policy based evidence. And any organization that is involved in perpetuating the attitude that the World Health Organization is taking is doing a great disservice to people who are using a very deadly product and don't need to. And I suppose the, the end of that sentence is <laughs> that the, the fact that it's the World Health Organization gives national governments an excuse not to look at the evidence that maybe is just next door to them. Very good point. Um, on, do you have any comments? I was just going to say, part of that question related specifically to Norway, and I see uh, Karl Lund uh, sitting right there, so maybe do you have any view from the Norwegian perspective on that question? Which question? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> well, uh, part of the question was, it, it said, um, and the Norwegian <laughs> Cancer Institute um, in terms of... Um, uh, perpetuating views to the to the COP, etc. With uh, it was just one of the examples given, and I was thinking because you were from Norway, you might have a view to help answer that. Well, I wasn't aware of that that they were uh, part of the FCTC. Um, so I, I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry. Um, I think that the Norwegian health authorities have some representative there. Um, but I don't think it's right that the cancer... The question related, I think, to, to funding. Um, the funding. So, yes, it was um, funding. Um, uh, FCA is separate from WHO and funded by entities like Tobacco Free Kids, Norwegian Cancer Institute. So the question is, okay. Norwegian Cancer Institute is providing funds to the FCA, which is aligning and, and propelling the WHO's views uh, against harm reduction, e-cigarettes, etc. So it's saying, is this a problem or a concern? But I suppose the question is, is there, do we know for sure whether the Norwegian Cancer Institute is providing funding to FCA? I, I don't know that. Wh whoever wrote the question might know that. Um, and therefore, it would help you answer it. I think the broader point yeah. here is that the WHO and those people who administrate it and write its policy for the approval of its members in the states that are part of it um, are part of a, a very narrow um, set of people where dissenting opinions are shot down because they go against the general consensus that continued use of nicotine where it doesn't kill you is a bad thing. 
And the question is less about money and more about groupthink. And, and the major problem that we see within the organizations that are influencing the World Health Organization is groupthink. And because of their incredibly narrow and restrictive interpretation of Article 5.3, all of us are tobacco companies and they won't listen to us. That, 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 that's what the heart of the question is. Um, and uh, is that a problem? Yes, it, it's, it's a very major problem. How do you influence the World Health Organization? I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in the World Health Organization. Maybe there are people in the audience who are members of the Framework Convention Alliance who might have some ideas for us, but it, it's certainly not my area of expertise. Anyone? Clive? Clive, yes. Can someone please give Clive a microphone? No, we need the microphone. Jerry's insisted so we can capture your comments on camera. Yeah. I would be, on the, on the specific question, I would be less concerned about the spending that goes on the FCA, which performs a useful sort of facilitating secretariat type role for a large number of small organizations. It forms an umbrella that allows them to participate and come to common positions. And actually the position they came to on ENDS for the last uh, COP6 was actually very constructive and that was brokered by the FCA and it was far better than it would have been had there been no FCA there. The big money doesn't come from Norwegian Cancer Society, it comes in through three main foundations, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation and they are not so much funding the FCA itself, um, you could probably be better if they did, uh, but they're funding large numbers of uh, what they call civil society organizations uh, in all the countries that are represented at the, uh, F uh, at the FCTC meetings. And that, that funding runs to tens of millions of dollars. It's, it's not a trivial amount. Um, and I've just been looking at the spending in Africa. Over the last few years, I think something like $24 million have been spent on African civil society organizations by two of those foundations. So a lot of money is going in through that route. Then it's, it's sort of mediated. So the money that comes in through... Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies is actually mediated by the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. Uh, in other words, they have given a grant to CTFK which then administers the program on behalf of, of, of Bloomberg. And the problem, of course, is that CTFK comes with an extremely hostile attitude to these technologies. It's trying to get them basically closed down and effectively banned in the United States. So nobody's getting any reinforcing messages, quite the contrary. Uh, through those, through the way that that funding is flowing through the system. It's quite fascinating. Certainly, a, um, a public choice economist's uh, delight if they started to look into that. Anyway, I know we, we only have uh, time for w one more question. I think we, we, I've got two left, but we'll see. I'll do do one more, and um, it comes from Tom uh, Prune. Pruin. Pruin, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's not your writing, it's my eyes. Um, uh, national and international agencies that should be giving advice on relative risk are either failing to do so or are actively misinforming. How does the panel think this can be changed or countered? This should be a fairly quick one because we've sort of discussed that already. All right, so I'll go to the last question, uh, which comes from Brian Coe in the UK. Will there be a monitoring mechanism put in place to, res to measure the impact of Article 20 to the, UK, to the EU Tobacco Products Directive on smoking prevalence? I guess that goes to you, Peter, in the first instance. I I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but I'm going to interpret it as meaning. Um, is somebody going to monitor the effect on the vaping market of the Tobacco Products Directive, which came into force on the 20th of May. Um, yes, they are. They're called the MHRA and the Department of Health. Um, and, um, well, and Robert West, who, is, uh, undertaking, uh, who undertakes a monthly smoking survey in the United Kingdom. Um, but the, the government will be watching it, and the European Commission is bound also to review the directive and produce a report within five years of implementation. Um, I, I don't know what those reports will be. Yes, it will be monitored, um, is the answer to the question. I think the broader question is what effect will it have on the market? And it will cause a, a fairly significant amount of consolidation. It will prevent innovation from moving at the speed that it has. Um, 
and it will prevent a lot of very good devices from going onto the market because of <coughs> fairly arbitrary restrictions on tank size and nicotine. Okay, I think we need to end, but before we do, I would just like to ask each of the panelists to give um, just one sentence or two at the maximum of what you think are, you know, is, is the main issue and you, what you think is the main importance uh, going forward. Judith. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit Australian centric. <laughs> I That's want right. a nicotine legalised in Australia. <laughs> Simple as okay. that. Globally, we need to start seeing more evidence-based policy and less policy-based evidence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's not my line, by the way. I stole it from someone else. Uh, I, and I'm going to steal my line from somebody else as well. I want us to start rethinking nicotine. Mm -hmm. I'm a little less ambitious. I think that just understanding the difference between nicotine and tar slash tobacco and you know like combustibles is essential in the medical community at least because it's not understood at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you all, as you're doing, put your hands together for the panel. I think they've been great and they've been some issues.